starting lineup of your favorite show and producer, 5'11", from Blanchester, the cow killer, Casey McCollister, and comic engineer, standing at 4'8", the pride of the west side, Elliot Rearing. Well, 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 good morning, good morning, and a pleasant good Friday morning. Casey McAllister, welcome back. Everything okay? You all right? I'm, I'm doing fine, Tom. You sure? Yeah, I just had to go to the other side of the building, up the couple floors of the, of the building, because all the stalls back there were being used. Gotcha. Which is why we're like five minutes late, That's okay. instead of being That's right. like a minute I just late, want to make so. sure you're okay, yeah. boiler hadn't gone south. No. Nothing like that? Nothing like that. Okay. I'm sitting in for Trace Fowler today. We welcome you to Off the Bench, presented by our good friends at United Dairy Farmers. I'm Tom Brenneman. Great to see you again. As you know, we come your way Monday through Friday, 10 to 12. How about that? Casey is on his game right from the get-go. You can check us out on YouTube, the Chatterbox Sports page. Many of you already in the chat this morning and tuned in. Uh, You can also download us in podcast form. Just search Off the Bench. And you're dialed in. We also broadcast live on X, formerly known as Twitter. Search a Chatterbox Sports page and you can follow me on X at Tom Brenneman TV. Speaking of Chatterbox, the boys are on the move, or at least we are led to believe. One final weekend in Arizona covering the Red Legs. You can check out their incredible journey. Again, just go to X, our Chatterbox Sports page. They're going to miss that weather in Arizona. It's like clockwork this time of year. All right, let's begin with the Cincinnati Bengals. They've been busy. Very, very busy. They have a new tight end. They have a new running back. They brought back our main man, Von Bell. Brand new duo back there at safety. Along with Geno Stone. We're going to get into all this a little bit later. They've signed Sheldon Rankins. To hopefully start to shore up that run defense. Although DJ Reader now a lion. But they aren't finished yet, apparently. The team hosted another defensive lineman yesterday. They hosted a former 11th overall pick in the draft. Offensive lineman Becton yesterday to potentially replace Jonah Williams. Who, by the way, got $30 million in Arizona. We will talk about all of this Bengals offseason. In a matter of moments. Other football news. The Chiefs have signed Hollywood Brown in their quest for a third straight Super Bowl title. And the Chargers, they're having to unload everybody. Everybody. Because of the salary cap issues. Keenan Allen is now a Chicago Bear who will be throwing him the ball. That's TBD. All right, on to hoops. The madness of March as we know it. UC won their first two Big 12 tournament games. But the run ended last night, a 68-56 loss to Baylor. A third game in three days really caught up with the Cats. They simply ran out of steam in the second half. With three minutes left in the game, three starters had a combined three points. Dede Thomas, Lukosius, and Aziz Bandego. And that is not going to cut it, especially in the Big 12. Now the question is, do they have any shot whatsoever at the NCAA tournament. They've won 20 games in by far the best conference in college basketball. And believe me, after watching more and more of the Big East, the Big 12 makes the Big East look like the minor leagues. It's not to say that every team in the Big 12 would beat every team in the Big East. It's not what I'm saying. But you go UConn, and then really it's everybody else. Marquette's good. Creighton can be good. But but, but they're not. They're not with these big 12 teams. They're just simply not, especially once you start going to three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 deep. No, no. So we find out Sunday if the Cats have any shot. More than likely, they don't. We know that Xavier, the Musketeer season is over. No NCAA, apparently no NIT. It's the school's first losing season in 26 years. Since Skip Prosser's second year going back to the mid-1990s. 
X played UConn, jumped out to a 10 0 lead yesterday in the Big East tournament. UConn then outscored the Muskies by 37 points the rest of the game in a 27 point win. Sean Miller, I thought he was great during his post conference, uh, post game conference yesterday. You may have seen it. He was fantastic. He laid it all out there. But look, he's got work to do. But, you know, he has to be very encouraged that Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter are both coming back next year. That's like going out in the transfer portal and bringing in two big-time players. So lots to look forward to with X. Oliveri leaves, but outside of that, they're going to be all right. Miami lost to Akron in the MAC tournament yesterday. That sets up a two-versus-three showdown in the semis tonight in Cleveland. The Zips face the hottest team in the state of Ohio. That's right. The Ohio University Bobcats. They have won 11 of 12. They're blowing everybody out, including Western Michigan yesterday. Tonight, the tip at 630. The number one seed, Toledo, has already lost. Now, I'm not saying that means whoever wins this game tonight is an automatic win for the championship. But this is a huge game tonight. For the Bobcat faithful, Bobcat Nation, huge game tonight. They beat Akron about 10 days ago. Akron's very good. All right, then there's Ohio State. Ohio State is making a bid to make the NCAA tournament. Who would have thought that when they fired Chris Holtman about a month and a half ago? They have won seven of eight games under interim head coach Jake Diebler. After they beat Iowa in the Big Ten tournament last night, 90-78. to The Mighty Buckeyes face number 13, Illinois, tonight at 630. If they win, are they in? That means they'd have wins over the number 12 or 13 team in the country, Illinois. They've beaten Purdue the way they're playing under a new head coach. We'll see. Indiana's playing its best basketball of the season. They advance to the Big Ten quarters. Their fifth straight win, 61-59 over Penn State. The Hoosiers face Nebraska tonight at 9 o'clock. The winner of that game plays the winner of Ohio State, Illinois, in the semis. Now, I got to ask you, I root for them. So I don't want anybody to misunderstand me here where I'm starting and going down this road because I do genuinely root for them, the Dayton Flyers. But I'm waiting for somebody to explain to me why Dayton is an automatic NCAA tournament team. Now, I know they're ranked 24th in the country. And I know they have wins this year very early in the year. Their best three wins this season happened in the first month of the season. They beat Oakland, who's an NCAA tournament team. They beat St. John's, who's walking right on that tightrope. And they beat the UC Bearcats. But they finished in third place in the Atlantic 10. They lose yesterday in their first game in the conference tournament, which means they've now lost three of their last nine games. Furthermore, only St. Mary's and Gonzaga, who are in the same conference, have played an easier schedule among the top 45 rated teams in this morning's Ken Palm rankings. I'm just throwing it out there. Why are they an automatic bid? In the last two weeks, they've gone in these bracketology things from a number five seed all the way down to a nine seed. I would be very nervous if I were Dayton this morning. Very, very nervous. Number nine, Kentucky. We know they're in. They'll open play in the SEC tournament tonight against Texas A&M. Tip-off set for seven o'clock. On the baseball front, the Reds lost to the defending world champion Texas Rangers last night, 7-4. They host Kansas City today in Goodyear at 4 o'clock. Now, I have to check the chat before we go any further because um, Mr. Moe says, doesn't the A-10 always get three or four teams in the tourney? No, they don't. They do not. Um UD fan 07 says Dayton won the games they had to win in the non-conference. True. I just acknowledge that. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, you sit there and you look at those Ken Palm rankings this morning, okay? Dayton is 32. 
UC dropped from 31 to 39, losing to Baylor last night. Baylor, who's a top 15 team all year long, right? I'm just sitting there and looking at it. You know, I, and again, the, the metrics are way over my pay scale, okay? I, and I'll say that ahead of time. But I look at things like teams like Washington State. Washington State is ranked 41st in the Ken Palm. And everybody has them as an automatic bid to the tournament. Now, if they win the Pac-12 tournament, that is an automatic bid. But why are they in? I look at some of these other, I mean, teams like Michigan State have a far superior Ken Palm ranking, and they've lost 13 games. They're still alive in a Big Ten tournament. They are far better in the Ken Palm than Dayton, right? And, and, and everybody says they're kind of walking this fine line. I don't know. I, I, I tell you, um, I think it's really going to be interesting. And, of course, as some of these teams lose, like Dayton, like Indiana State, like some of these teams that, you know, you thought were going to be in for sure, and now all of a sudden, Toledo. Now, they, you're never going to get two bids. It would be rare to get two bids in the Mid-American Conference. I'd make the argument the Mid-American Conference basketball is as good as the A-10. They don't play the same schedule. And top to bottom, they may not be as good. I don't know. I don't know. Um, all right. Let, let's start with UC. No chance, right, Casey? None. And you end up getting in the tournament. Despite winning 20 games in the Big 12, they only had two losses outside of the Big 12 to Dayton and Xavier. They have so many close games this year against the best competition on the planet. Right. But they're not going to make it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, they, had to, they had to win – yesterday for them to even have a, a chance um a, a punter's chance right and then they would probably have to even make it to the finals to to have a a serious chance to to make it i do feel like if they were to have snuck away with a couple wins here and there that we're not having this conversation tom like if they just there's no doubt about if it. they just beat texas yeah or if they just beat like oklahoma Oklahoma or they don't lose to West Virginia the way that they did early on we're probably not having this conversation yeah and it's a shame really because I mean what was it a combined 30 something points over the last 30 they lost eight games this year in the big 12 all in the big 12 by a combined 32 points it's crazy it's That's crazy just crazy and I think to the team like the biggest problem, the biggest issue with them is just their consistency. They're not very consistent at all. None of their players are. It doesn't feel like you get a consistent game out of anyone on that roster, um, especially on offense. But I would say the same thing about defense, too. Like, they, they don't always show up, and that's their greatest strength. Yeah. So, to me, it's, it's a shame that they didn't get in um, or that they're not being considered to get in, especially over teams that – like I, I kind, I'm kind of with you on the Dayton thing. I know Dayton beat the snot out of UC, but yeah, they did. Um, that might be the only reason why, right? Like if Dayton doesn't win that game, they're probably not even. They're for sure not in. Um, well, Dayton and, and is rooting UC big is. time. I mean, the chances of this happening are slim and none. But Dayton is rooting, rooting big time for St. John's to knock off UConn tonight because Dayton did beat St. John's like the second, third, fourth game of the year. Yeah, that's not happening though. No. Although, you know, hey, you know, it just goes to show you, right? Goes to show you out there all those people who were so up in arms about Rick Patino ripping into his players and ripping into his team. Oh, my God. How can he do that? He's hurting people's feelings. Not their feelings, Tom. Not their feelings. They're undefeated since that rant from Patino. They are 6-0. and oh. Since that rant by Patino. Now, again, they're facing UConn tonight. So, you know, uh, it probably comes to an end. Look, and a lot of people here are jumping on me saying that, um, uh, that uh, about comparing UC to, to Dayton. I'm not comparing UC to Dayton. Yeah. I never said that. Yeah. I, mean, I just brought up, I, I just asked the question, how it is that you finish. Well, well let's start with this for a second. 
How is Dayton ranked 24th when they finished third in the Atlantic 10? So, okay, now you get bias, you get all kinds of things. And again, I am a Dayton fan. I love Dayton. I love what they're all about. I love the program. I love the gym. I love the town. I, I, I love it all. I was just up at UD Arena the other night. It's the best. I've said it before. The best, the best college basketball arena in the country, bar none. And they got a good team. I'm just asking the question, what makes them an automatic team to get in this year? They could bounce their first game in the A-10 tournament by Duquesne? That's a tough loss. You know, uh, college basketball to me, Tom, is almost the inverse when you when the old ways of doing college football where it mattered what you did at the end, right, to get in a lot of the time. But college basketball is the inverse of that. It, if you have a bad loss here in your non-conference, you just get completely disregarded for the most part. Yep. I don't blame UC for not having a, a tough out-of-conference schedule. I mean, they played in the toughest conference in college basketball and they weren't even really supposed to be in this position anyways no one expected them to be this close to a tournament team um so and when i was comparing uc to dayton i'm not just comparing uc to dayton i'm comparing uc to other teams that are um you know that they they had a tough out of conference schedule but didn't do so hot in their conference or that not what they expected to do dayton should be destroying that conference for them to be an automatic bid, but they're third in their conference. So that's where I'm at on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like going back to UC and whether or not they should be in the tournament or not, there is a, there is a problem with losing close games. You got to finish those games out. And, and, and really it's just a coin flip. Honestly, they're, they're right there on some of those games. Um, they're one game, two, two, two games, I feel like, away from being right there. And I don't know where they would be at if they beat Texas, if they beat Oklahoma, if they don't lose to West Virginia. I don't know what seed well, they would be. Well, put it this way. They, they, right now, they're 39 in the Ken Palm. They were 32 going, 31 going into the game last night against Baylor. They lose to Baylor. I don't know how you lose to Baylor and drop eight spots, but they did. But the bottom line is, is if they had, like you said, two or three more of those close ones, just two, two more, Texas, Oklahoma, somebody like that, right? Yeah. Even Baylor. They lost to Baylor by three at Baylor right. earlier this year. And they had a chance to win the game on the last possession of the game. Um, oh, I mean, they, they'd be up in the high 20s and they'd be in. But they're not. But they're not. Um, you know, we talked about Xavier and, and, and getting Fremantle back next year, getting uh, Jerome Hunter back next year, all the very leaves. Claude is back. McKnight is back. They, they, they got some good stuff going on at X. UC has everybody back except for uh, John Newman the third, And he's a good leader on that team. But they, all the rest of those guys can all come back. Locken can come back. Bandago, Reynolds. We know Jizzle James, a freshman. Day Day Thomas comes back. Dan Skillings comes back. Lukosius comes back. They, they got a lot to look forward to. They're on the right track for sure. If West can keep this team together and not lose anyone to the transfer portal, especially uh, like Jizzle James, I feel like a lot of people are scared that he'll He's not up, and, up and leave. But if he can keep the team together, I, I like their chances a lot. I like, they just need one guy, one one guy, like an Olivari, to come in, and it just yep. skyrockets their chances You're of right. being a really good team. I think we all know that that's the biggest issue. It's just they need a consistent score. They have not had that. And I think you can supplement other other ways of scoring if you just continue to have guys like Skillings and Lukosius who basically take turns on who's going to do well. And when they both do well, they usually win, but – my point is, you get a consistent score in there. Occasionally, Lukosius will go off. Occasionally, Skillings will go off. You got enough uh, defense there with, with Day Day. And uh, maybe if you can get maybe better play from Bandango and, and Reynolds. I don't know about Reynolds. Um, it just seems like he just 
never materialized what this team wanted well, him to be. He just came but, on late. You know, he started yeah. late and he started coming on and playing better late. I think he. I, I think that's going to be a really good duo with a full off season to practice, knowing they're both eligible. Van Dago, those two guys fill a really, really important role. Van Dago's a great shot blocker. He's got to get you though, eight to ten a game. If nothing else, on offensive rebounds and stickbacks. Every game, Bandago and Reynolds should be combining next year. I'll give them a little rope this year because they both waited to find out if they were going to be eligible. They couldn't practice. All this kind of stuff going on with a two-time transfer. But, but that duo next year, full year of Big 12 basketball under their belt. They know what they're getting into. That duo next year should combine for about 17 points and 10 to 12 rebounds a game. That's your center position. And at least three to five block shots a game. Because Van Dago is a shot blocking machine. Well, you start there, you, you bring up a great point. If they can find a guy like an Oliveri, because Skillings is going to be a great star. He is really going to be a great player. Yeah. He is going to be fantastic. And Day Day Thomas is going to be really good next year. James just gets better and better. Um, I really like UC's future. Um, Blackmore says the chat is missing Reed today. So, Reed's busy. Reed's at Miami. Yeah, Miami of Ohio, up there sipping high noons. And we, we got some softball and some baseball today. Yeah. I don't know what the who they're playing just yet. I haven't looked at that schedule. But, uh, yeah, if you're interested, go go watch it at Seabox. Uh, watch Seabox Sports, something like that. That will be a, a, a good watch, the softball. Softball game at five. Uh, the uh, player formerly known as Toxic Cop, <laughs> who changes his name and picture all the time, Mouse Cop. He asks a question, will Wes Miller be fired if he doesn't make the tournament next year? That's a very legitimate question. Although I'm told they love Wes Miller down there at UC. They love him. He's doing it the right way. And um, – they're heading in the right direction. You say whatever you want. You can be a UC lover, UC hater. You know, uh, on the coaching thing, uh, and, and look, I don't know how much of this stuff is true or not true. We were talking about Ohio State. This Jake Diebler guy, I mean, they look like a completely different team. And, 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 you know, you hear that word about culture all the time and this kind of thing when Chris Holtman was here. And Holtman is a hell of a basketball coach. I mean, he really is. He was just hired yesterday, got a six-year deal at DePaul to try and get that mess turned around. Good luck on that one. But he is a solid coach, does things the right way, straight shooter, a great representative of the university. But ever since they fired him and Diebler takes over, this young, aggressive guy, his brother played at Ohio State. I mean, you just watch them even in the moments, and I was watching yesterday, right before the tip-off. They had, they had announced, introduced the starting lineups already. And then all of the players are coming over to Diebler. And, and they're, 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 they're fist-pumping him. And Bruce Thornton, their guard, gives him a big hug and has this huge smile on his face. And the players made the comment after the game. We didn't feel pressure to win when Diebler took over. He says, we feel a sense of urgency. That's what Jamison Battle was saying, that, that, that we're better than what we've shown. And, I mean, they're not beating teams. They are blowing teams out all of a sudden. You know, they get the big win over Purdue. Nebraska's the third seed. They went and beat them. They smashed Michigan State on the road. They were like a three-point favorite against Rutgers. They win by 22. Um, Iowa has total control of that game. against, And I'm not saying that any of those teams are any great shakes. Certainly Purdue is good, and Michigan State's good. But this is a huge game tonight for Ohio State. But anyway, back to the coaching thing. Now, Gene Smith is retiring as their athletic director. We know that. That'll be at the end of June. They already have the guy who's going to replace him came from uh, Tech, Texas A&M. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Comes from Texas A&M. 
and he's already in the building working and is going to help lead the search for uh, the next basketball coach, right? So here you got Diebler. They've won seven of eight games since he took over. What if they beat Illinois tonight and then get to the Big Ten semis and, and, and they face Indiana or Nebraska? Can they win that game? Of course they can win that game. Well, what if they face Purdue in the championship game? They've already beaten Purdue. So it's not like it's – is it likely? No. Possible? Certainly. If they get to the NCAA tournament, are you replacing Diebler? And apparently the story yesterday came out of Columbus. And again, whether this is true or not, I don't know. But originally it was thought that there were three primary guys on the short list to replace ultimately Holtman, right, as a head coach. They were Dusty May – down at Florida Atlantic, who led his team to the title game, Final Four last year. Um, the guy at South Carolina, who just signed a contract extension yesterday, Paris, and Sean Miller. Well, apparently, some of the big money guys in Columbus have made it very clear to those that, that have a say in this thing, they don't want Sean Miller. Now, again, how much of that is true? I don't know. Do I think Sean Miller would leave Xavier to go to Ohio State? I don't. I think that Sean left once to go to the big school, big money program in Arizona. He won a ton of games. Xavier hired him under a cloud of uncertainty with the NCAA and all that kind of thing. He was cleared of all that, as we know. Um, I think Miller is here for the long haul. Uh, So it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, up there. And then last but not least, I brought it up earlier, Ohio University. Casey, it always seems like when all's said and done, mm-hmm. we end up talking about Ohio University. They're always in the picture They're always somehow. in the hunt in everything. In everything. In the map. They got the best facilities. They got the best coaches. And they I tell you, if party. you haven't watched them tonight, now look, they might get beat tonight. They're playing the team that most people felt like was the best team in the MAC all year long, even though they finished – One game behind Toledo. Toledo got knocked out the number one seed in the tournament yesterday. But most people felt like Akron was the best team over the course of the year. OU beat them recently, and OU is the hottest team in the MAC tournament still alive right now. That cannot be denied. But, you know, if you got some free time tonight, I would would check it out because that's going to be a good game. And either one of those teams, if they get to the NCAA tournament, I'm telling you, man, that is not going to be an easy out. Just ask Virginia two years ago against Ohio University. Just ask them all about it. Big high seed, run into the Bobcats, adios. Okay, any other thoughts about anything involving college basketball? Anything on your mind, Casey? By the way, we have Charlie Goldsmith coming up at 11. He's out there in Arizona with the Reds. And, of course, he's uh, very much in tune with everything happening uh, with the Bengals as well. That's right. So anything on your mind left in college basketball? College basketball, no. not, not uh, Nothing that is currently going to pique anyone's interest locally. Um, I'm excited for, for selection Sunday. It'll be a good time. Cause last year, March madness, we did a whole, uh, I don't know if you remember, we went to the, not Buffalo wild wings. Where'd we go? That one place. Yeah. 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 It was fun. That was fun. When we yeah. did the, the first 60, the 64, first, the 64, I don't, I don't know how you, uh, yes. the first round of the tournament, That's we right. all sat there and we enjoyed March madness with you guys. They're at the uh, – I don't know if it was – I'm just going to say Buffalo Wild Wings. It wasn't that. It was, no and it free was something ads, like that. Wings and rings. Wings and rings yeah, 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 is what yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. And that was a good time. That, uh, that was a really fun time. Maybe we'll do something like that again here soon. Well, we got to get everybody back here because you guys have been working literally morning, noon, and night. I mean, again, Toxic Cop took a shot at his buddy Reed. I mean, you and Reed have completely held down the fort – I just pitch in whenever I can. But you guys have been holding down the fort literally morning, noon, and night while those guys are teeing it up out in Arizona, going to NASCAR races. Yeah, yeah, yep. 
Yeah, we, we've drinking been... beer with the guy from the Holy Grail, and uh, and you know, hanging out with Marty Brenneman, watching baseball games. Yeah, they're having a good time. We're we're over here grinding, and we've never done better. Or this week has been phenomenal. We, I, I will take the time to just say that everyone that has been watching our videos, has been watching the show, been giving us likes and a lot of interactions. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. It's been a fun week. Um, this is a time of year where I really enjoy Bengals talk. Um, and we're about to get into that right now because, Tom, we have not really discussed your thoughts on a lot of these transactions I mean, you were here Monday morning, and yeah. I don't think we had really... That's when everything was just getting started. That's when everything was getting started. So we have not heard your thoughts on this Bengals offseason and how they're doing. Your initial thoughts, anything that concerns you or things that uh, you're excited for? Uh, let me just make one final uh, comment from the chat, and then I'll answer your question. Because Toxic Cop is, is all over it today. And this is one <laughs> of the great messages of all time. Yeah. He says, the way Elliot has fleeced Chatterbox needs to be studied and written about for future generations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what, a, what a trip he got to go on. Oh, but, hey. my God. Oh, my God. That's good stuff. Okay. All right. Um, Molly, welcome in. Nice to have you back. That means that uh, Reed is, is logged in. All right. Um, let me say, first of all, there are bigger names. Well, no, no, let me start off. Let me, from the very, very beginning, take three steps back here. I love the fact that we are now in about a third or fourth consecutive year after literally decades of doing nothing. We are in the third or fourth consecutive year now of the Bengals being active players in the free agent market. I mean, they shocked us. With all the defensive moves they made three years ago when they brought in Hendrickson and Reeder and Von Bell and all these guys, right? Um, then they go address the offensive line with Orlando Brown Jr. Shocked us all last year uh, with that move, um, among many others. And they're not sitting on their hands again this offseason. So I, I give them incredible credit for being a major player. I mean, the, the, the Bengals are one of the major players now in free agency for the top of the line talent. And that's the beauty of the NFL. And their, you know, basically their, their, their uh, socialism type uh, fiscal model is that the small franchises can be just as big a player in the free agent market as the biggest city franchise, right? Right. And so that's what makes it beautiful. And the Bengals have wasted no time. Duke Tobin and company, Katie Brown, Troy Blackburn, all of them, wasted no time in getting to work. I love bringing Von Bell back. That's a huge move. I mean, there are other moves that get a lot more headlines. And look, I didn't watch Von Bell play barely at all last year. So I don't know if the guy lost a step. I don't know. But all I know is, is that this guy is an incredible leader. I mean, even going all the way back, Irvin Meyer will tell you to this day, the guy that started the whole thing when Meyer took over to get that train rolling in a national championship and all the college football playoffs, the most important player in that whole operation was Von Bell. Well, we saw what he meant to this team, right? And... You know, they weren't coming out and saying it publicly necessarily until the, the, the season was over or near the tail end of the year. But there must have been some major issues with the safety play last year. I mean, we know gave, they gave up all those explosive plays, the most in the NFL, right? Right. That's uh, 12 or more yards on the ground, 20 or more yards in the air on a play. They, they allowed the most explosive plays – of all teams in the National Football League last year. And that's why they weren't in the playoffs, not just because of Joe Burrow. It was a defense. Um, for them to go get two brand-new starting safeties, 
it tells you, A, they made a mistake the year before. But it also tells you they, they understand they made a mistake, they admitted to making a mistake, and they're now trying to correct that mistake with Stone and Bell, right? Yeah. I, I don't know if Bell is going to be starting. I, I think if he is Von Bell – you know, that he hasn't had a, a, a step back in his career, that there is a more than a 50% chance that he ends up starting because of how good that makes him on our team. But I think this is more of a depth ad. I mean, it's one year. Um, yeah. Most of the salary is being paid for by the Panthers. I do think that him being there is a great thing because of the leadership role. He knows this defense. I think he's going to help those guys out tremendously. Yep. I think the big point that you like that you made is that they gave up a lot of explosive plays. They did not have the character traits for these guys that they're not character traits, the physical traits that they needed for these guys to do what Jesse Bates did, which is sideline to sideline, deep coverage ball um, that they're getting now with Geno Stone. Yeah. So for me. The secondary, the safeties room has been majorly improved. It might be one of the best safety rooms um, in terms of depth, no in doubt. terms of, of what's there no doubt. Um, in the National Football yep. League. I do think yesterday, just to get into some of the stuff that happened yesterday, DJ Reader signs with the Lions. All right, I to- want to break these down individually, though. So go ahead. I don't want to interrupt you, but we're going to address each of these okay. things. Okay, you want me? I'll, I'll, I'll let's wait. Start with, I'll no, wait let's then. start with Reader. Okay. So Reader was signed to a two year, $27.25 million deal, um, $9 million guaranteed. So essentially, if he plays bad, it's a one year, $9 million deal. That's basically what that boils down to. If he does not recover, if he's not the same DJ reader, they only really risked $9 million. Um, that's a very smart move for the lions. In, in my opinion, um, essentially was the same money. If he is DJ reader for Sheldon Rankins, if you want to look at it that way, we basically just swapped reader for Rankins I don't know if that's a great one-for-one trade, right. but with the injury concerns and whatnot that surround DJ Reader, I feel like that's a it's a safe it was a safe bet to just move on and get cheaper there, anyways, because one he only played like fifty percent of the snaps on his contract, so he was already very injury prone. Thirty, another second major injury yep. to the legs, which is his key that's that's the power that's where his power comes from is his legs so i know a lot of people are very upset that dj reader left basically for the same type of money i don't think the Bengals were in that market for dj reader because one obviously he left but two um the injury stuff the age uh the position he plays and on top of that you can just get cheaper with tier tart in my opinion. Okay. And, but, okay. So I, let's stop there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All well said, spot on. But he, here's my question. Okay. I really like the rank and sign. Okay. For multiple reasons. He not only can do well against a run, he also can get after the quarterback a little bit. I, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, look, I, I think that's certainly a positive sign. But then I ask myself, okay. Let, let's just put the Rankins thing over here on a shelf for a minute. And now I ask myself, where would I rather spend my money? On a guy who has been blessed with incredible talent and has been just like this in Tart. I mean, th- this guy was put on waivers last year. Okay? Right. There's something going on with him. And is he young enough to get it together and play up to his potential again as he did two years ago down in Tennessee? Yes, he can. And I hope for his sake that he does. But there are certainly questions. Is he younger than Reader? Yeah. Has he been productive, as productive as Reader? Not last year. Year before, their stats were very, very similar. Very similar when he played well. Okay? But he's never lived up to his potential. Reader has gone by his potential in his career. He has done 
everything and then some with all his God-given ability. Top shelf guy, no questions about Reader except for a big one, right? Age, it's only 30, and his quad. So I ask myself, if I'm going to take a chance, and this is where I guess you're going to have to trust that the Bengals clearly know what's going on in terms of Reader's recovery, how he's doing, when will he potentially really be ready to play again. I mean, he's going to be ready training camp. He's going to be ready for the season opener. Is he maybe a third or fourth week of the season guy? You know, they know all those answers. I don't. But boy, if uh, if I had to pick, if you know, even with the age difference, and it's not some huge difference. Tart's been around the block a time or two now. What's a three year gap? It has to be the injury part of this that kept the Bengals from signing Reader. Yeah, because there are too many other things that he checks the box, right? Right. Before Tart does. Very important things. Maximizing your talent. Leader, right? right. Relentless, right? Yep. Never a guy who's going to be put on waivers. Ever. No. Never. So, you know, I'm trusting here that uh, the Bengals know all about uh, the injury situation. Because if he is healthy... It's a mistake not bringing Reader back. Correct. 100%. I mean, the, to just to go into uh, a little bit of the comparison between Tierra Tart and DJ Reader, I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it's night and day, but yeah, just like you said, the leadership there, um, the actual physical ability on the field, I would even say DJ Reader it, it does a lot more than what Tierra Tart does. Yes. I know they have very similar stats that one year. But he's not an every down player either. I mean, he was only playing on first and second down and coming out on third down when they needed some more pass rush. Yep. He's not known to be this guy that adds that ability. DJ Reader, although he was a nose tackle, he could get after people on third down yes, too. He, he was an every down type of guy. Um, you're losing that. So they still really have this potential hole there even if they signed Tier Tart with at least trying to be able to do both things on third down, if it is like third and five, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? You have to make that decision. Well, do we have Rankins and BJ Hill in there or do we have Rankins and, and Tier Tart now? Right. Back then in 2021, it was you just throw in DJ Reader and, you know, he's going to at least add some sort of ability. He's so good that you can't not have him in there on third down. Now, Tier Tart makes you a lot cheaper at that position, which I think is a good thing in the long run. You need to get cheaper there. And by the way... It's a good thing in the long run if it's money well spent, cheaper money. Right. And it's, it's best in the long run if you're going to take that money, which I think there's somewhere, correct me, Casey, you, you really follow this closely. There's somewhere depending on a, a couple of things. And, and this can always change if guys want to restructure their contract, kind of like um, who was it just did it the other day, restructured their deal so they could bring in some more players. Uh, the big quarterback, who am I forgetting here? They just redid their deal a couple of days ago. And Bosa just redid his, for example, with the Chargers to stay in L.A., right? right. Joey Bosa. So, you know, there are Bengals players that could do that if they wanted to do it. But right now, as we sit here, I think there's still somewhere between 24 and $30 million under the cap. That's right. Okay, so what are they going to do with the money? Exactly. But my, I'm with you on that, Tom. I'm getting to the point where if they don't get Tier Tart, I'm starting to worry about what they do with that money because there's not a lot of places to go spend that type of money. And we'll have that same conversation that you and I have had time and time again about they're not spending to the cap, yada, yada. We're not there at that point yet. They did have Tier Tart and Makai Becton come in yep. for visits yesterday. Uh, creepily, there was photos out there. Makai Becton at the precinct with Joey Burrow, and uh, you know they're they're out there. It really I'm, is creepy. You bring up a great <laughs> point. I got to tell you, man. I mean, 
X is a dark place, man. <laughs> it really is. I, I'm being totally serious. And especially these clowns who don't put their name on the stuff. But I mean, the, you know, the, I mean, it, saw him at Skyline, saw him at Kroger, saw, you know, I mean, are you kidding? And then just randomly sitting in a restaurant and you want to go start taking pictures of people who are sitting there wanting to eat their dinners? I mean, man, stuff's out of control, man. Yeah. But at least we know that they had that dinner with Joseph Lee Burrow. And uh, if anyone's going to convince them to sign deals, it's going to be him. Now, if they don't get deals done with these guys, I'm going to start to hit the panic button a little bit because yeah. I, there's just not very many guys out there that I feel comfortable with replacing uh, at the nose tackle position or right tackle. And I'm not really comfortable with Makai being the starting right tackle going into this year. I view him more as a swing guy. I expect the Bengals to pick a right tackle in the draft, but we can get into that later. Oh, but I think I think even if they take a really good right tackle in the draft, if they sign Becton, he's going to start the season opener. I don't, I don't know. He's got a lot of experience. He's been through a lot of injuries. No doubt about that. Moved from left tackle to right tackle because of all the injuries. Uh, he suffered early in his career, but this cat was the 11th pick in the draft. I know. years ago. He's got some serious physical He's got some really good physical traits. Yes, yes. All right, uh, we're, we're going to break all of this down uh, up up till um, noon. I mentioned we got Charlie Goldsmith coming on uh, here in about eight minutes, so we'll, we'll step out and talk a little bit of Bengal stuff. Uh, I mean, a little bit of red stuff, and, and we'll ask him about the Bengal stuff as well because he, he covers the team. Right. I mean, relentlessly, um, and so he knows what's going on. Uh, we'll ask him about some of this stuff, and then you and I can start walking through some of the other moves at tight end, at running back, and some of these things. It's still what needs to get done. But if you can read the ads, I'll race out be right back. We appreciate all of you with us today. we got a ton of people in here in the, uh, in the house today, so it's good to have everybody back. Casey, take it. All right, Tom. The Bengals report is brought to you by Encore Technologies. Encore Technologies provides IT solutions for a data center world with a suite of services from mobile computing to desktop to data center, supporting both centralized and work from home computing modules to improve efficiency and productivity. That's right, productivity. You can visit Encore.tech. The path to innovation begins here. <laughs> that was so stupid. <laughs> um, uh, I got this new bottle of water right here made right here in Hamilton, Ohio, called Pawnee Water. <laughs> Pawnee Water uses natural limestone filtration, unlike the artificial processing that other brands use. The result is a healthy alkaline water. Some say the best tasting water in the world. Visit Pawnee Water at P-A-H-H-N-I water.com to see where you can buy it. And let me tell you about our new, new sponsor, oh, the Game Time app. Game time helped me out a lot last year. Anytime I needed to do last minute ticket shopping, game time shopping, I would use the game time app and uh, all their pricing up front. You don't need to uh, go through all those stupid steps to find out what all the extra fees are. It's two simple clicks and boom, you got your pricing, you got your ticket. You can see exactly where you're sitting. You know exactly that I'm going to sit in the left outfield in the third row or uh, all the way in the nosebleeds. Doesn't matter. You're gonna get a good photo uh, where, wherever you decide to sit. Use code OTB to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. That's code OTB. Download the Game Time app. Put in the code OTB. Get twenty dollars off your first purchase, and you'll be ready for any of the games. Whenever you want to purchase a ticket. Now. Um, we did have some news about the Bengals. We had uh, an underrated signing that I'm really excited for. Uh, Tanner Hudson, he's back. I love Tanner Hudson, uh, the tight end. I think he's great depth on this team. I think that uh, Mike Gusecki is going to be taking all those snaps mostly from him. But if anything were to happen to Gusecki, I'm not worried. I think the tight ends did great last year for what they were asked to do, for how much we used them. And Tanner Hudson, I think he had like almost 400 yards last year. I mean, it, this is a guy that uh, 
underrated. I don't know why he wasn't signed to another team. It's probably just because of his age and that he doesn't have the notoriety that other guys do. And it is what it is. Um, but I love the signing. I love the depth there at tight end now. Yeah. I don't feel like they have to – I. this is me trying to predict the future a little bit, and we don't have to get into this um because we're gonna have uh we're gonna have charlie goldsmith on here very shortly but i feel like we're gonna have an answer at tight end here very soon and i don't think it's coming from the draft that's just a little prediction a little little thing up here is telling me that there's a guy that we just brought in that i really love love his ras score and we know how i feel about ras scores oh, love what he can do on the field but he's got to stay healthy and uh, he's got to learn the system so we'll, we'll wait and see and we'll talk more about that uh, in a moment Tom. Yes. So just to recap, you are a little nervous about DJ Reader not coming back. I am. I mean, I, I, you know what? I'm not going to say, well, I'm nervous because they were so horrifically, historically bad yep. against a run last year, especially in a division, which is the best division in the NFL, not even close. That's number one. Number two, it's gotten even better. I'm telling you, this Derrick Henry thing is a monster sign for Baltimore. They are basically saying, we are going to pound people to death. That scares me. Yeah. I mean, they've got a quarterback that can throw it. Now, he hasn't taken him to the Super Bowl. He's won a couple of MVPs, including this year. But, you know, he hasn't gotten it done when it matters the most. So he's got something to prove out there. But my goodness, you know, you start playing that RPO game with that Ravens team this coming year, and they got Henry back there, and you know the way Lamar can run it, although he didn't run it much during the regular season. Ran it pretty well in the postseason once they got there before they got bounced. But, man, um, Chubb, uh, you know, was the best running back by far in the division. Arguably one of the top two or three just straight running running backs in the league. Uh, relentless worker. Apparently an incredible kid, from what I'm told. Um, and, but he's, he's coming back from that devastating knee injury. Okay, and then the Steelers, their M.O. is to pound you to death running the ball, right? The, I mean, they got their guys coming back. And they've added Russell Wilson. And they already have a really good defense. So, you know, am I worried they lost E.J. Reader? Time will tell on that one. I'm worried about replacing him in the ability to stop the run. Rankins is a good step in the right direction. They need more help. You know, I always wonder how much draft picks, what kind of an impact draft picks can make right from the get-go. Miles Murphy was a late first-round pick. By all accounts, was a project, so to speak, right? Yep. Great physical tools. And by the end of the year, he was playing pretty good football. But we didn't even know it th it, through the first 13 weeks of the season he was even on a team. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, time will tell. And, and, and you know what? Let's start with Charlie uh, on some of this stuff before we get to the Reds. Kind enough to join us from out in Goodyear, Arizona. Our good friend from Cincinnati.com, Charlie Goldsmith. Charlie, how are you, man? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing fine. Pleasant good morning to you. It's uh, almost 8 o'clock there. Uh, and uh, day game today against Kansas City. Before we get to the Reds, I want to ask you your overall thoughts on what the Bengals have done so far. So when we kind of started this offseason conversation, we started talking about T. Higgins, and the existential debate was, can you keep three or two star wide receivers plus Burrow and still fill all your other needs? And the Bengals you know, still have work to do. But one, they have the room to do it. And two, just the amount of players they signed, frankly, is more than I expected because of the values they've gotten, because of the efficiency with how this front office has worked to address positions like safety, like defensive tackle, running back, tight end. I think it's been a really solid overall offseason for them. You know, isn't it great, Charlie? I mean, I, I, I joked around in, in, in the socialistic uh, 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 fiscal um, model that the NFL is. But, but boy, man, if you're a fan of a team in a 30th or 32nd market uh, in the country, as is the case here in Cincinnati, to know that your team, and this is about a four-year run now, 
where the Bengals have gone out there and they have been uber active in free agency. When you get into baseball in the Reds case, you know, you're very limited as to what teams are making, uh, you know, New York compared to Cincinnati. It, it is, it is I, I give them all the credit in the world for stepping out there uh, and continuing to be extremely proactive. That to me was, you know, the Orlando Brown Jr. signing yep. in a nutshell. Look at all the upfront guaranteed money. They've never done stuff like that. That's a sign that they've just pushed more chips in than they've been willing to push over, you know, the course of their franchise. You know, you'd like to see them do another Orlando Brown style move with, say, an aggressive signing bonus or, or contract construction like that to be even more creative and flexible with your cap space. That'd be like even more of a chips to the middle of the table move for them. They haven't quite done that version of that yet this year, but they're always in the top 10 to 12 in the league in spending. You know, you have the Burrow contract. Higgins has a big cap hit with guaranteed money. So they're doing a lot to feel the best team they can. When you look at uh, now what's left to do, we were, we were just talking at length about, you know, Reader going to the Lions. You sign Rankins. They had Tart in here on a visit yesterday. Um, do you think that, that, that based on everything that's happened so far, Moss comes in, you bring in another tight end, you re-sign Tanner Hudson. It was announced just a little while today. You bring Von Bell back. Do you think that the defensive line is like the number one priority at this point? Or... Do you think that right tackle, uh, when all said and done, if they had to go throw a bunch of money at one or the other, which one you think they're doing? It's funny. So I, I could see it. I could see it both ways. I kind of view it two different ways. I see right tackle as a more glaring need because, like, you need someone who can go in and start week one if you need it. Like, you gotta have it. You just absolutely need it to make sure it's not Deontay Smith or Jackson Carmen out there week one. Um, but then there's the draft class as well. So I think you're going to be able to find a better long-term answer through the draft. So I think you need someone who you know can play week one at right tackle. With defensive tackle, either you're finding a long-term solution like Tier Tart, or, you know, many teams have done this where they have nose tackles like Josh Tupo, you know, not him specifically um, coming back, but a guy like that who maybe we've never heard of who can kind of eat innings for you and chew snaps and plug gaps up the hole or up the middle uh, against the run. So to me, I kind of, I'd put more chips in the right tackle basket right now unless you really think Tier Tart is your future. If he's not your future, then maybe take a smaller swing, spread that out with right tackle and maybe even out a corner or something, and then really use the draft to finalize right tackle and defensive tackle. Okay. All right. Uh, let's shift gears to the Reds. Um, you know, look, I, I, I wrestle with this whole thing um, all the time about – you know, not getting too wrapped up in the numbers on what guys are doing, pro or con, um, in spring training. But I do get concerned when you're talking about guys who are coming off of injuries. So let's start with Matt McClain. It was last Sunday he returns to the starting lineup, the exact same time that India comes back after dealing with all this plantar fascia stuff. India has looked very good at the plate. McClain does not have a hit. Does that concern you at all? I think there's some concerning things overall in camp. I haven't worried much about Matt McClain. I think like the quality of the contact's fine. The ball's carrying fine. He's working tough at bats. He's seeing pitches well. Really, the seeing pitches well part is the part he was most concerned, anxious, whatever you want to say, because of just you. You need a certain amount of you need to see a certain amount of pitches before the season starts. Um, he was more concerned about that than than any sort of swing or anything like that coming back from the injury. So I think McLean's fine, going to be fine. Yeah, you know, you'd like to see some of the pitchers do better. Uh, there are certainly some position players here kind of waiting for them to click into full steam, full gear. But, you know, I'm not worried about the best player. I think Matt McLean's their best player. Well, then, then at the end of the day, um, you know, just based on this past week, or so let's say the first two weeks of games, now into the third week of games, what, what would be the one or two very positive developments for you? Because you're every day, morning, noon, and night right there. And then the two or three things that you would say, ooh, this is something that's caught my eye that maybe doesn't look so good. Uh, India kind of has a more fluid, less mechanical swing that he's kind of letting it take it where it takes him. Um, he's looked great. He just looks more comfortable, more powerful, more aggressive. Another one, Stuart Fairchild. Like, I know, all right, he, he was in the mix for the 26 man spot. We kind of know who he is. He kind of looks like a bit of a different player. And I get the sense that kind of he's showing them enough that they're going to really try to find him some more at bats over the course of the season. Again, he looks like a different guy. On the negative end, you know, there's the pitching. And again, you, you don't put too much stock into the results, but there are a couple things for a couple guys that 
are percolating, as you like to say. Uh, like Frankie Montas, this command has to be better. Andrew Rabbit, he's working on establishing that high fastball in the inside part of the plate. He's admitted he's not doing that well enough. Big thing for Graham Ashcraft. He's a ground ball pitcher, but he needs more strikeouts through his slider. That slider, he said, hasn't been good enough this spring. Hunter Green, the secondary pitches, it's not like you're going full steam ahead. All right, these things are rolling at this point of the spring right now. Lodolo's looked unbelievable, but but even him, you know, coming back from the injury and all that stuff. So every pitcher kind of has a, a little thing you, you hang up on and you'd really like to see take one more stride with before the end of the spring. Ultimately, I think the talent plays out and when healthy, these guys are going to be fine. But yeah, it hasn't been a, a perfect spring for those guys with the stuff they've been working on. You know, I never had a chance to ask you this because uh, we didn't get together last week. I, I, um, I'm i not sure what to make of that whole Montas opening day thing. And I don't want to turn this into some, you know, deep, you know, Freudian kind of conversation from a mental standpoint. But, you know, I sit there and I look at that and I say to myself, there's got to be something more than just meets the eye on that thing. Because this guy's never thrown a pitch for the Reds. He pitched in one game all of last season. He's not pitched well so far this spring. And yet you have guys like Green, Ashcraft, not so much Lodolo because he basically missed all of last year, but certainly Abbott, who was the best of that group uh, up until the very end when he just ran out of gas. For Montas, for me, I was, I was really shocked by that. I know Montas has had two bad outings this spring. I think that if you came in, if you're, you know, David Bell's been here a while, but if you're a brand new manager and you came in here and you're putting your scouting hat on, who's looked like the best pitcher in the staff this spring? I think that's Frankie Montas. And I know that hasn't translated with the most recent spring training results. He's also pitched in a couple minor league games and I know he's facing minor league hitters, but when you just compare the stuff to everyone else, I think Frankie Montas has won that tryout, has won that audition. He's looked like the best player here. Uh, so that, I think, was really the determining and deciding factor of giving him the opening day start, kind of letting the results speak for themselves. Now, the more the more interesting point to me is what you were alluding out with Hunter Green. And I was very uh, interested to talk to him and see what Hunter had to say. And one of the most interesting things I've heard him say was this. He said, if I needed not getting the opening day start to give me a kick in the tail, he said, he said, that'd be a problem. He said if he needed that like snub mm-hmm. or slight or chip on his shoulder, he said if that was what was motivating him, that wouldn't be a sign. Green said this for, you know, what's driving Green to become the pitcher he's trying to be. He said this too. He says, and it was really interesting perspective. He said, people need to remember, I didn't really pitch in the minor leagues because of Tommy John and COVID. He, he didn't pitch in college. Hunter Green said he's still kind of in the, in the process of really finalizing 100% what his prime is going to look like in terms of what's he going to do, what's he going to be, how is he going to sequence, all this little stuff about being a pitcher. Last year was a growth year for him. This year has to be a step for him. He said it's time. But in terms of the kick in the tail stuff, he said that that can't be what motivates him because otherwise, and I agree, you know, that's not kind of what you want, motivating your faces of the franchise. No, you don't. Um, okay, last thing um, that I want to ask you about, now that we're starting to look ahead a week, I mean, because we're less than two weeks out now from opening day, what are some of the big things to maybe keep an eye on uh, between now and, say, you know, uh, this time next week? So, it's, you know, a big rotation battle heading into camp. I honestly feel like I have a worse feel for how it's going to shape up now than I did at the start of camp. And, you know, that's some good and some bad. Like, all right, so Nick Martinez, if we were talking at this time yesterday, I'd say what he did against the Dodgers, that's you've got to put me in the rotation type stuff. Now he may have a displaced rib. We'll get more information today. He's expected to pitch tomorrow, though, so I so I guess that's fine. And David Bell said he has been dealing with it before. So, again, I guess that's fine, but we'll get more information. Um, Abbott's had a little bit tougher of a spring than maybe I expected heading in. And then Lodolo, he's really going to miss one start and then come back. So, all right, Green's a lock. Lodolo, or let's skip Lodolo. Green's a lock. Um, Montas is a lock. Ashcraft's a lock. Lodolo, when healthy, is a lock. Is Martinez your five? Is Abbott your five? Um, do you have Abbott as your five with Martinez in the bullpen? Do you give Brandon Williamson a spot start and then bring Lodolo back and send Williamson down? Do you give Martinez that spot start and give him, move him to the bullpen? Do you keep Martinez in the rotation, give Abbott the spot start, and then move Abbott down? Like There are a million move, moving pieces. They're, they're having these debates about how it's going to shape out. I think you need to see a little more down the stretch in this camp. The last thing I want to ask you about is, Charlie, because um, uh, we, we had talked about this long before it happened last year 
Uh, you take away April because it, a limited number of appearances, but in May and June and July, Alexis Diaz was running the ground. Uh, the, the entire bullpen was. I mean, the, the starting rotation is not giving you anything last year. That's got to change clearly this year. How has he looked this spring? Because if you look at some of the numbers, you kind of say, hmm, not missing a lot of bats. He's walking some guys. Um, what are your thoughts on him so far this spring? Because that really hadn't been talked about much. Yeah, so here's the honest evaluation. I've checked in on this because I saw his velo was 91-92 instead of 93-4-5. And I was like, is, that, is everything okay? And the answer I got was the fastball is actually riding and – elevating through the zone better and actually looks better now even at a lower velo than it did at this point last spring uh, so that's a good sign and then the slider last night was phenomenal I, I think overall it hasn't been you know prime peak Alexis Diaz but I was told was he's out of stage now where he really gets to use spring training as a ramp up they feel okay. like he knows it He's very young. They feel like because of his brother, because of the attention to detail he puts into all of this process, he knows exactly what he's doing to get ready for the season. So, uh, I, again, I checked in because I was concerned about the velocity and kind of a couple outside, couple inside opinions. The answer I got was he's fine. He's the closer. He should be good in April. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to monitor over the course of the year. Okay. Charlie, as always, we thank you for your time, my friend. Uh, enjoy the Arizona sunshine, and uh, we'll check in with you sometime next week, hopefully. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you too. Charlie Goldsmith, kind enough to join us from Cincinnati.com. I mean, he's got it all covered. I mean, you talk about anything with that dude. Yes, I was going to get into UC with him, but I mean, I don't want to wear him out. He's kind enough to join us at 8 o'clock in the morning out there. It's a three-hour spread now. Right. Yeah, they're, they're on a... See, he's there. What do you think our guys from Chatterbox are doing right now? Do you think they're even out of the rack? <sighs> That's what they're doing, Tom. They're, they're snoozing right now. They were up late, too. They were watching uh, – I think they were watching the UC game, so I don't know. The uh, UC game came on at 6.30 there. Oh, it was – I don't know. It was late here. 6.30. I know. It was over at 8.30. They were watching the UC game while they were watching the Reds game over at Surprise, Arizona against the Rangers. I forgot about the time difference that we just talked about. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. They're probably still sleeping, though. They've, they've had a tough, tough week. I mean, it's a long week, lots of uh, content that they're working on. So, What are they working on? Content. I know, like what? Uh, videos, live streams. They are doing live streams. They've been doing live streams. They've been uh, – I think they're doing, like, maybe they're doing a golf video. I don't – I don't know. Okay. I think that so was stuff for the when they get back, they'll edit it up, package it up, that whole thing. I think maybe. I don't want to guarantee anything. Yeah, I wouldn't guarantee anything. Um, you know, one, one of the things, and and um, Rob Butcher, who just retired recently, is the Reds director of media relations, who is one of the best, if not the best, at his job of anybody that I have ever seen. Um, and congratulations to Rob and his wife, Dana. They're going to have a chance to spend a lot of time together. She worked for a long time. Maybe she still does for uh, MLB.com. Um, but Larry Herms is now the head of the Reds media relations department. And, you know, this is one of those things, and this isn't to sit here in any form or fashion and pick on anybody because it, it, these guys, they're flooded, they're overwhelmed with requests and all these kinds of things whether it's interviews with players, whether it's media credentials, whatever the case may be. But the Reds have had a longstanding policy, and I don't know what the policy is for other teams. I don't know. But as the legacy media has certainly changed, and you have companies like Chatterbox, and there are others, we're not the only one out there, where you're getting incredible following. I mean, let's not forget, this Chatterbox Reds show, and this isn't, I'm using it as an example, not to pat ourselves on the back. This Chatterbox Reds show started last year. By the end of last season, it was one of the seven most watched and downloaded baseball-only shows in the world. Yeah. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say this isn't like some hyperbole thing here. I think it had the seventh most downloads or views on Apple, right? Yep. Of any baseball only show in the world. So I bring this up because, you know, um, 
our guys were hoping to go out there and be able to get media credentials to go in and do interviews and do all this kind of thing. Well, the Reds haven't moved in that direction yet. I got a feeling they'll start to move in that direction um, sooner or later. I really do think they will. Um, the guys have still been out there showing up and all that kind of thing. But, man, you know, um, I, I, I really hope that it does begin to change because, look, I don't know what the numbers are, say, for extra innings on, on WLW after a game. I don't know what they are. I know there was, at one point in time, that was an unbelievably popular show, especially when Tracy Jones did it. Um, but, I mean, I could be 1,000% wrong. But I would have to believe that that Chatterbox Red show, for the younger Reds fan, which baseball is always looking for the younger fan, right? Yep. I mean... There are a lot of Reds fans paying attention to that show and getting a lot of their coverage of Reds baseball off of that show. Yeah. Yeah. We, our uh, growth in that department and the Reds coverage is, is huge. I it's mean, unreal. It's, it's unreal. It really is. It's unreal. And, and it's thanks to all of you. I mean, Nick and Trace do a great job on it. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and they keep it fun, and they keep it lively. Um, but, man, um, you know, I, I really wish those guys would have been able to, to go out there and maybe sit down with different players and, you know, have access to, to interviewing a bunch of guys uh, that you would normally get if you have credentials. Because uh, otherwise, as you know, we've seen on some of their content, you're outside the chain link fence as opposed to being inside the chain link fence, right? Right. Yeah, and – not to not to uh, leave any of the teams out. We would love for us to be that in tune or not in tune. We are very in tune with Bengals, but to be that entrenched in um, and, and that watched and that revered in, in Bengals content. Yeah. So, um, thank you though for this week. The people that are watching a lot of a lot of the Bengals viewers. Uh, we appreciate your uh, your support. Um, any thoughts from Charlie Goldsmith that stuck out to you, Tom, that, that we haven't already touched and discussed? I'm just wondering down the road if we're ever going to hear a little bit more about this opening day thing. I, I, there is something there. Charlie's smart enough to figure I mean, look, he went right to Hunter Green and asked him the question. And Hunter Green has, the, as he always does, he has – the right, the right response. Hey, if, there, if that's supposed to be motivation for me to kick it into gear, then I got my own problems. But this is a franchise that you have built this entire operation around this influx of extremely talented young players and pitchers. That is the Cincinnati Reds idea identity locally and nationally hunter green lodolo ashcraft abbott lesser extent williamson some of these young pitchers they have coming up right connor phillips whoever else you want to ellie de la cruz matt mclean encarnacion strand Marte before the suspension steer friedel Th this is and 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 and, and indian and stevenson are still young this is your identity. This is who they look at the Reds and they're like, oh boy, that team's got some serious potential. And yet you name a guy who's basically been hurt for two years, who pitched in one game last year, one inning last year because of a shoulder injury. And after 10 days, two starts, maybe three starts into spring training, he's named your opening day starter. Now, a lot of people are going to say it's only one game, and they're right. You're right if you say that. It's only one game. But, but it's more than one game. There is, there is uh, in this town especially, more than any other. And Look, I've announced for three different teams, and I've announced an opening day game in damn near every town in the United States with doing baseball for 30-plus years. 
and only whatever it was, you know, 15 of those were with the Reds. So, I mean, I've had opening days in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, all of them, Denver. Nothing is like opening day in Cincinnati. And so the second game of the season, maybe you forget all about it. But I just, you know, I, I just, I wonder. I wonder if there's something not more at work here on this deal with Frankie Montas. Yeah. Being named your opening day starter. And him not playing well this spring is not, <laughs> doesn't help that case out either. Sir Boy Wonder says, quite honestly, Tom, Hunter Green hasn't deserved it. That's the bottom line. And you know what? I think you're right, Sir Boy. Sir Boy's uh, right on a lot of things. Um, but, I, you know, I, I sort of feel like, okay, well, if Green hasn't, to me, I think Abbott or Ashcraft, you can make the argument, did earn it. Abbott was mighty good for this team until they started extended him innings, which, which he had gone well past where they wanted him to, to try to stay alive down the stretch. And he got kicked around a little, uh, a lot near the end of the year. Um, and Ashcraft, although he can never stay healthy, same as Green, same as Lodolo, um, when Ashcraft is on the mound and healthy, this dude is good. And he's got a chance to be really good, I think. Ashcraft does. But, I mean, if you were to compare Abbott, Ashcraft, and Montas as your opening day starter, and again, I don't want to blow this, this out, of, out of proportion here because it is just one game and then the rest of your season continues. you got 161 more after it. And hopefully more than that if you're playing into October or early November. But uh, to me, there's something more at work here. I don't know that. Uh, I don't talk to anybody at all involved with that franchise anymore in any form or fashion. Uh, but to me, uh, th th there's just too many sort of uh, blanks left to fill in there that you can try to start filling them in as to why this decision was made. Uh, and it can't be because Frankie Montas's first start was better than the rest of them in spring training. Because yeah. truth be told, Brandon Williamson's first start was better than any of them. His second start. Yeah. So, and it doesn't even look like he's going to be in a starting rotation. So, um, and that's a good problem to have. Really good problem to have. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a couple of other things uh, in regard. I want to get back to some of the Bengal stuff. Okay. Um, uh, Justin says, well, what is it then? Money? No, I don't think it's money. I don't think the Reds have ever played that game. I really don't. I think some franchises do. Uh, I don't think that because they're paying Montas, whatever it is, 15, 16, 17 million this year on a one-year deal, uh, I don't think that has anything to do with him getting the opening day start. I, I do have uh, one thought on it, too, because I just now remembered something that I learned from last year because I'm learning the game of baseball. Yes, you are. and you, You're all in. Is this potentially to try to manipulate the lineup so we get a guy that's better at pitching against a certain team? I haven't looked at the Reds – schedule to to know for certain but is that possibly in the cards to where well he montas has more experience a lot more when he was healthy and pitching in oakland he was a rock solid pitcher not a great pitcher but a rock solid he has a lot more experience okay um but if you're talking about if you're just talking about missing bats right guy takes a mound and you're a batter. Yeah. And this isn't a slap on Frankie Montas. You, you could plug in any name you want in baseball, really. Okay? Outside of maybe the very best of the best. But if you were, if you were to poll 500 batters, and you would ask them, if you had to step in the batter's box right now and bet your season's pay on getting a hit – against Frankie Montas or Hunter Green. 498 would pick I'd rather face Montas. Oh, yeah. I 100% I, I, uh, agree with you on that. But, I mean, like, 
I'm just looking at their schedule right now. They play Washington. Yeah. Who's I, not supposed I, to be very good. Yeah, they Nationals. were awful last year. But then they go play at Philadelphia. They come home for the Mets. Yeah. And then they play Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I like the start of that season if you're a Reds <laughs> because none of those teams are any good. Yeah, and then the, the White Sox right after that. Yeah. Not that we're getting – we're not going to get too deep into the schedule no. talk here, but that's just another thought, too, that I had that came across my mind that might be a reason why he's starting on opening day just for a better matchup later on down the road. But anyways. Molly um, likes it because she says Montas is not bad looking either. <laughs> that a girl, Molly. She wants to know with the other ladies, is she right on that one? So, Tom, this last half hour of the show, um, I know we're going to get into the back half of the other Bengals talk that we kind of went over some of the concerns, and now we're going to try to talk about some of the good things that happened yep. over the uh, off season that um, I'm sure we're we're going to touch on here in a second. I'm going to open up phone lines because people have oh, been boy. clamoring to to ask you questions. I'm sure about Reds and Bengals uh, conversation. Remember the phone line is right here. I don't know if you guys can see that if you're watching, but the number is 888-513-2269. I'm going to open it up here in just a minute. Uh, let me get it set up. I My know computer I is about early. to go out of juice here. I thought uh -oh. I charged this thing last night, or maybe the battery's gone south. All right, go ahead. What's the phone right. line? The phone line is 888-513-2269. Again, five or eight 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 five one three two two six nine, and uh, we'll we'll take some phone calls here in the last okay, half hour. Well, uh, please jump on by all means. I'd love to hear uh, from all of you, any of you, um, and and what might be on your mind. Um, how are they pronouncing this tight end's name? I have heard this said a hundred different ways in the last three days. Gasecki. Gasecki. Yeah. Okay. Again, um, by all accounts, when healthy, when with a quarterback that can actually throw the ball, yeah, right, tremendously talented and gifted athlete and receiver. Maybe not a great blocker, but, you know, they brought back Sample. They got Tanner Hudson coming back. Gusecki is a guy that um, – that could do a lot of great things, I think, for this Bengals team in the absence of Tyler Boyd. I think that's where his impact will happen, right? Right. In those kinds of situations where he's locked up with a safety, he's locked up with a linebacker. This kid is a really, really good athlete and has had some outstanding years when he was playing in Miami before he was shipped off uh, to – you know, arguably one of the worst offenses in the history of football in New England. Yep. You like the sign? I love the signing, Tom. Uh, people will look at that Miami year and that New England year and go, oh, this guy's washed up. He's 28. He's not going to be very good. I completely 100% disagree with that take. Here's the thing. Would you rather be throwing to Tyree Kill or would you throw to Mike Kosecki? That, that's what happened that final year in Miami. And Tua, I hate to say this, I'm not a big fan of Tua. I don't think he's a great quarterback. He is a Tyree Kill merchant. He throws and forces throws to Tyree Kill because he's Tyree Kill. Hence, he had half the amount of targets that final year in Miami than he did previously. Yep. And he still did quite well in terms of numbers with the half the amount of targets and receptions. He played all 17 games. And then you go to my, uh, you go to New England um, on a, I forget, it was like a six, six million dollar deal or seven million dollar deal for one year, and you're playing behind guys like Hunter Henry yeah. who fit that mold much better for that team. Mike Kosicki will probably be solely playing slot. In all honesty, yes. I, don't, I don't expect him to be playing in line. No, you know, hands in the dirt no. at all. No, now. He might prove prove me wrong and all of a sudden learn how to, to end line block, but I, I kind of doubt that. That's not who he's been the, his whole career. But, man, when he was the slot guy for Miami, I mean, he could just grab a – snag a ball from anywhere on the field. 
This dude has massive wingspan. He's a big dude. He runs like a 4-4 or something like that. He was one of the highest graded tight ends coming out of college athletically. And I remember pounding my fists on the table way back when, when he was coming into the NFL, that I wanted this guy because I thought he would be the next great tight end. And for a while, I feel like he did kind of fit that mold as like that top eight, top five tight end status receiving wise. Um, and I still feel like he has that potential in him, to be honest with you, Tom. Uh, that New England offense was miserable. You just look at the numbers, right? Only 45 targets for 244 yards, two touchdowns, but averages eight yards of reception. That's not bad. Yep. Um, well, it's quite good. Yeah, I mean, for, for the limited amount of targets. And let's be real here. If – if we go to this sort of system, right, where Mike Kosicki takes over the slot duties and gets all the receiving throws for the tight ends, he's going to get somewhere near 85 targets probably, maybe even more than that because he's taking over Tyler Boyd's role yeah. and the receiving tight end role. I love that proposition. I, I love that. I love that for us. And it just makes it to where you have – not just two really, really good deep threats. You have three now. You have guys that can really go up and jump jump up and get a ball. And Joe Burrow's accurate enough to where he can put it exactly where he needs to, yep. where only Mike can get it, where only T can get it. And, of course, Jamar Chase. He's not as big as those guys, but he's Jamar Chase. So I, I love this addition to the Bengals. A th- uh, $3 million? Yeah. Yep. I'll take that every single day. I agree. And you get a guy who's hungry to try and get another contract. So, I mean, he's all in to have the best season he's ever had in his life because he wants to keep playing football. He's only 28. Right. So, you know, those are the guys you want. We talk all the time about guaranteed contracts and that kind of thing. And can people kind of rest on their laurels? Some do, some don't. But, you know, there's no doubt they're getting a hungry player who wants to be really good again and wants to continue to play. Uh, And and so – you know, uh, I, I thought it was an excellent sign. There were a lot of people that were hoping that maybe they would do the same thing with uh, Hayden Hurst that they did with Von Bell yeah, and maybe bring him back. They made that decision. That tight end room is full now. I'd be shocked if there's any changes now that you've officially brought back Hudson, Sample, Sign Gusecki, done, over, right? Yeah. So now we're talking with Charlie. It's all about right tackle, and it's about defensive line. All right. I want to get into the, the running back thing for a minute because, you know, I've just kind of been sitting back watching you guys, listening to other people on, 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 on talk radio, okay? Um, I, I have no problem whatsoever. And look, who am I? I'm not sitting here making any judgment on it, okay? I mean, my import, uh, opinion is no better or no worse than anybody else's. But I think you can, you can say, hey, it was time for Mixon to go. We brought in a younger player, okay, who we think is a better pass blocker has had bigger rushing days than Mixon has had here over the last year or two when he's been the primary back, right? He had big days rushing, Zach Moss did, when when Jonathan Taylor was out. He has proven that he doesn't have to be in every down back and that he's okay with sharing time, which he's going to do with Chase Brown. I don't understand why people have to get so negative then and mean about Mixon. Why can't you just say, man... That dude played his ass off here in Cincinnati. And that is one thing you can never take away from Joe Bexton. That guy gave you everything he had, every single play, every single practice, off season. It wasn't until about the last year where some stuff started creeping up that wasn't good, right? But the bottom line is he played his ass off for this franchise. So why can't people just say, Hey, and some do. Why can't people just say, man, what a career. Joe Mixon, one day you're going in that ring of honor. There's no doubt about that. 
Yep. One of the top three or four backs in the history of the franchise from an all-around standpoint. And we wish you nothing but the best in Houston where he just gets a three-year deal for $27 million. Yeah, I feel like I, – I think people are upset because they wanted to keep Joe Mixon here. Let me try to put a, a spin zone on it that this is actually best for both parties. And I know Mixon didn't want to leave, but let's be honest with you. He got a, a great deal. He was going to probably – I mean, he was going to get cut. I mean, he was probably going to make a lot less than what uh, – you know, may, maybe – I don't know. Maybe he would get more, but I, I doubt that. Um, Mixon in this offense, I think, proved that it doesn't necessarily work in a way. And let me try to explain that. Zach Taylor has proven – Time and time and time again, when Joe Burrow is healthy, he wants to throw the ball. We sat up here in the middle of, of, of September and October, Tom, and pounded our fist for Zach Taylor to just run the ball. Run the ball with Joe Mixon. Run it. And he refused. Joe Burrow goes down against the Ravens. They start running the ball. They change their offense completely, and he does better. Gets more opportunities, gets more times to touch the ball, to get yards, to grind out yards. The Bengals' offense, what they hope for it to become, is a maximum of 15 to 18 carries a game at most. And in those opportunities – you need to be explosive. You can't grind out yards. you got to be very explosive because you're not going to get very many opportunities. Joe Mixon just wasn't explosive enough in this offense for us to continue doing what we were doing with him, paying him the type of money that we were paying him. I almost know in the back of my mind, I almost know like deep down my heart, he's going to have another 1,000-yard season, maybe even 1,500 yards over in Texas because they run the ball. They predicate their team off of a run-first team, and then they get into the play action, bombs it away with C.J. Stroud. That is a perfect system for Joe, uh, for Joe Mixon. In Cincinnati, it wasn't going to work. And I've come around to that, that fact at this point. They've decided to go all in on the explosive guys, the guys that are going to rip the – rip rip right up through the hole and get 20 yards, but they're going to get stuffed in the backfield for minus two occasions. And we'll see if that hurts the Bengals because I think it's a – for me, I think the Bengals would be great at being a play-action, run-heavy team if Joe Burrow would just learn to, to, to be able to turn his back to the defense and be more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. We're past that now at this point. I think we're getting to an age where – and we've been here at this point, that Bengals don't want to run the ball. They want to throw with Joe Burrow. And so well, shipping Joe Mixon out for some value, I think, makes a whole lot of sense. And they didn't do him wrong. They cut him, then it, it, it's – you don't know what's going to happen to him. So I, I think that this overall is good for both parties if you look at it that way. Um. Because the Bengals were never going to change their scheme around for Joe Mixon. I think that's for certain. No, but I, I do think that everybody would agree with this point, that once they had to overhaul that offense in terms of a philosophy and they got back up under center when Jake Browning took over, right? Right. And they started to be a much more balanced team. Okay? Um, I think it will be fascinating to see if the Bengals do more of that and say to Burrow, hey, look, we know you might rather be in shotgun. And, and we were in shotgun a lot because of your calf last year. And we understand that we're probably going to throw the ball more times per game than run it. Okay. But it's not going to be because we, we've talked about this many times before. The games where the Bengals get beat up and beat up badly are the games where they're throwing it 75 to 80 percent of the time. So, you know, uh, uh, this, you know, 
I think this is one of those moments in time, and I'm not getting overly dramatic on it, but I have been around so many teams, basketball, football, baseball, where you try to basically pacify one or two of your biggest stars and what their preferences might be. And it could be on anything. It could be as big as how much are you going to be under center with the quarterback Burrow, which is a big decision. It's a big deal. Are you letting Burrow run the asylum? Or is this going to be like a nice little, hey, we're all on the same page. This is where we're going here. All the way down to team rules, silly stuff like team flights. You let the big guys kind of run everything. Sometimes that works out pretty good. Sometimes it doesn't. The Bengals need to run the football more this coming season than they have in the past. And this is potentially a very good explosive, to your point, duo, potentially explosive duo in Moss and Brown. Right? Right. So um, I, I just think that that, for me, above anything else, is the most interesting storyline when the Bengals hit minicamp, OTAs, how much we'll find out there, I don't know, but in, in uh, training camp to see what does that offense look like in 2024. Because you've made some major personnel changes here, right? You're going to have a new right tackle. You're going to have a new running back. Two new running backs, really. Brown didn't play much until the very end of last year. Two new running backs. You have a new tight end. You don't have your slot receiver from the past seven or eight seasons in Tyler Boyd around anymore. So there are changes going on here. You've got Higgins who, you know, I think the guy's a great kid, unbelievable kid, and he's going to be focused and be ready to play when the time comes. But what is their philosophy of this offense in 2024? Because if they're going to drop back and throw it 45 or 50 times a game, they're in trouble. I would agree with you, Tom. I would agree with you. I mean, I this is a very – troublesome trend on where they're they're heading <clears throat> but you know i if this is what they want to do this is where they want to lay their bed they're heading in that right direction right i think i think that this was the smart move that that's what they want to do now the only other signings that we haven't talked about i believe is gino stone well no we touched on that a little bit with Von yeah. bell um Really, the only thing that we haven't touched on, I guess, is just the right tackle spot and what they plan on doing for the future. And I think everyone would agree and un and um, believe that the Bengals are probably targeting a right tackle in the draft because there's so many of them. Mackay Becton, um, we talked about him a little bit, how we think that he's going to be a good signing for the Bengals if they do indeed sign him. I just feel like now at this point, if they can get Makai and T.R. Tart and they get him for what is projected for them, like a one-year, $6 million, $5 million deal for Makai, yeah. T.R. Tart's probably like two or three for, for cheap. Um, do you go back and look at T. Higgins with the rest of the money? No, I don't. You don't think so? No. Nope. Because you I could tag front load Higgins a two years in a row is what I do. Well, I ta I tag him each of the next two years. If he goes out and plays his tail off this year and can get on the field for every game, which would be a change, right? Yeah, I tag him again next year. I know that's the financially smart move for the Bengals. Well, I don't know if it is or not. I mean, come next year, we'll wait and see where they are. But I mean, make a guy pay him big dough. Right, what's the average of the top five guys in a league, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would be twenty six million next yeah, year. Right. So I mean you're gonna pay him twenty one, twenty two this year, right? Yep. I mean, you're talking about potentially paying a guy forty seven million dollars over the next two years. 
here's the cash, go play. We love you. We want you to be here. It doesn't mean we don't love you if we don't give you a long-term deal because we think it affects us in the long term. You're still going to be young enough, even after next year, not this year, but next year, where he can go out and get a big free agent contract if he plays up to his ability and gets on the field. Yeah. I am not locking up another wide receiver to a multi-year $30 million contract when I know that I'm going to have to pay Chase that. Do you go back and maybe not extend T, but extend Jamar then instead? No, I wouldn't do him either. There's no rush to do it. There is no rush to do it. See, unlike baseball, th this isn't going to be an enormous difference in cash waiting a year on Chase. You're going to pay a little bit more. But it's not going to be some, you know, some 15 or $20 million spread between right now and two years from now because of the salary cap. So if you can have, and I love when guys get their guaranteed money that have worked their tail off in football, unfortunately, for a lot of guys that work their tail off for a long, long, long time, they're kind of getting left out in the weeds a little bit here, right? You know, that have been really good, solid players for a long time. You know, they find themselves, you know, sniffing around for a job. But, so, I mean, look, whatever somebody can make, I'm all for it. God bless them. Having said that, if I'm the one doing the paying, what is my hurry to sign Jamar Chase to a long-term deal? I don't have to do it for three more years. I can tag him twice if I want to after this year. So, you know, I, I don't know unless you feel like his psyche is such where you have to give him this long-term deal and make him feel loved and wanted and all that kind of thing. Great. I only say that because – um, they if they if this is the are these the final moves that the Bengals make right? And you're asking yourself, what do they do with the rest of the the cap? Um, you can make it to where the cap hits are less when the in those years where Burrows are going to be more right. So you kind of balance it and distribute it a bit better. Yep, I think that's a smart move, but I don't know. Um. I don't know what the Bengals' plans are or what they would like to do if they're still trying to communicate with T maybe this offseason. Since they just did the tag, I don't know. Maybe they, they will try to continue to have negotiations later. But the idea of it being that if you could take the $22 million that you're already giving T, you already said that we have like $25 million left, we're probably going to end up somewhere with like fifteen. million to 17 after you sign Makai and and Tier Tart. Maybe you've put in the rest of the 5 to 10 that you have left over, juice up T's contract a little bit, or you do Jamar Chase's, you juice it up a little bit, and uh, you front load it and make sure that your cap pits aren't going to kill you later on. Well, I mean, look, there, there's certainly an argument to be made. And, that, and, and the way those things play out, you know, you, you've got people that that is their exact job inside of every franchise in football or all of the salary cap implications, so on and so forth. But what we've learned is over the last three years after the whole COVID thing, these, the salary cap is jumping by leaps and bounds year after year after year. Another huge jump this year. So, again, I just say to myself, what's the hurry? Let's find out if Higgins can play a full season. Let's find that out first. You've got Chase already on his deal. Fine. Let's find out what Higgins is going to do this year, healthy, play all the time, be the guy we saw his first three years in the league. Want to make a decision at the end of the year on then him? You want to trade him? You want to tag him again? You want to give him a long-term deal? I think that ship has sailed. Personally. Yeah. You disagree with that? No, I, I there's a very slim, small chance yeah. that they get a deal done with T at this point. I feel like we're heading down the same Jesse Bates road. Yep. Um, which is a shame. I 
I don't think that there's going to be a trade that materializes. I know we haven't really talked about that yet, but um, the the two um, trade opportunities that made sense to me were trading for a player of similar caliber. That way you're not um, trading for a, a draft picks because I don't think they're ever going to get the compensation they want for draft picks or they extend them, and I just don't think either of those are going to materialize at this point especially after T demanded a trade yep. at the start of free agency. That was not good for the value of T Higgins, what the Bengals could receive. You know, a lot T. of people have made this, this whole a big deal out of, and, 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 and I'm not suggesting that they're wrong for making out of a big deal out of about this whole agent representation thing with Higgins having the same guy as Bates, and it looks like we're going down, as you just said, that same road with Higgins that they went down with Bates, never got the long-term deal, seemed to be some animosity, sat out for a little while, uh, but showed up when it was time to get the paycheck. And Bates played his tail off. When the time came, he played, especially when it mattered most in the postseason. Um, and Bates never missed games. I mean, the guy played every game for you. Where Higgins has had, you know, Nick here, Nick there, whatever it might be. But, you know, as someone who has had an agent for most of their career, And every situation is different. But in its most basic premise, the agent is the employee. The boss is, in this case, the player. So before people want to start blaming the agent, and there are good agents and bad agents, just like there's good players and bad players. And I don't know this guy from Adam. Obviously, there must be people that think a lot of him because you're talking about some pretty high-character guys in Bates and Higgins, among others, that have this guy, right? Right. So these aren't like guys you're reading about in the police blotter on a regular basis, okay? These are guys that have their act together in Higgins and Bates. But for people to uh, automatically blame the agent if this thing doesn't get done, now, I don't know what this guy's you know, walking around feeling is about the Cincinnati Bengals and Mike Brown or Katie or Troy or whomever. I don't know. Maybe he walks around chapped at him 24-7. I don't know. But the bottom line is the player is the boss. The player's the boss, not the agent. So the player can say to the agent, I have said this myself. When I had a chance to leave Fox and go to another place, I said, look, I'm not leaving Fox. You want to use that leverage a little bit, it's fine. But I'm telling you at the end of the day, if this Fox thing gets close to falling through because you're playing hardball in some meeting with them, then your ass is fired. This is where I want to be. These are the people I want to work for. These are the people I want to be around. These are the, the, these are the events that I like doing. Is it perfect? No. No situation for anybody's perfect. But the player is the boss. So if, if people believe that the agent is the one that is blocking Jesse Bates getting a long-term deal here or T. Higgins getting a long-term deal here, then if that's true, then those two young men in Bates and Higgins are giving this, this guy way too much control of their lives and their livelihood. Cincinnati's a pretty good place to be right now for a wide receiver. Yeah. Pretty good place to be. And some can say, well, you know, maybe you want number one money. You want to go to Las Vegas and be number one? They, their quarterback is Aiden, what's his name, Aiden O'Connell. O'Connell, right now. That will change between now and the start of the season. Might be Justin Fields, whoever. But right now, you want to go to Minnesota? Now they have Jefferson, but I'm saying, let's just say he wasn't there. You want to go there and be number one? Kirk Cousins just walked out the door? Nope. Or do you want to be here and Burrow's throwing you the ball? In an offense, it is a pass-first offense. On a team 
that have been to the playoffs two years in a row, two championship games in a row, and one Super Bowl for, you know, easy for me to say, right? I've never made that kind of money for $3 million less. Cincinnati's a pretty good place to be. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the idea. I mean, anyone can say this uh, when, when we're all not millionaires here, but a little million here and there doesn't really feel like it is worth arguing over. Um, there is one thing about this uh, situation with T and Bates um, that does work in the favor of the Bengals, and that's if they have a bad season next year. You that's know what right. I mean? Like there, there is a, a point to where they can get a cheaper deal done if T has another season where he's hurt, doesn't play. That's right. Like if he has another season like he did last year, he's not getting the twenty-five no, million a he year. He's not. So there's that leverage too. So that's exactly right. That's why you know people get wrapped up in saying, "Oh gosh, he won't pay T," or "Oh gosh, he won't pay Jesse Bates." If you tagged T Higgins the next two years. You are paying this dude north of $47 million over two years. I'm not going to feel bad for T. Higgins. Are you? No, I'm not. I mean, I, as, as crappy as that is to say, I, I, I care about my team winning football games. That's exactly right. But we can be nice here, okay? It's just like the mixing thing. That's where we started this whole conversation. We don't have to walk around and bash Joe Mixon. The guy gave you everything he had. Right. Good luck to him. Okay, it makes fiscal sense. It makes production sense, at least on paper, that they're going the direction that they're going in. Smart move by the Bengals. Okay? Smart in that they got anything for Mixon. I mean, it might be some nothing draft pick, but who knows what that turns into. Probably will be nothing, but you never know. You never know. And good for Mixon. He gets a new three-year deal down in Houston on a team that made the playoffs last year, and he's going to play. Right? Yeah. Good for everybody. Be happy for everybody. You are happy for everybody, Casey. I am happy. I'm, I'm happy with the situation that ended up unfolding because I was afraid that it was going to be a situation where he gets cut, sent somewhere uh, – not sent somewhere, but goes somewhere – like the Ravens or Pittsburgh or the Chiefs, somewhere like that. Texans are up and coming. I I, I don't mind uh, him playing for C.J. Stroud. I think it's better for him as a player. I like I enjoy when players play well. Yeah. Too like that's another thing that kind of goes into my consideration here. He's going to play well in Houston. I just write it down. Write it down. It's a fact. Um. The only the only thing I'm I'm I have a concern with is just that we haven't signed Tier Tart and Makai Becton yet, and then it goes back to that same old question that I brought up earlier: is just what do you do with the rest of the cap? I don't know. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, Tom, wrapping up the show. Yep. Thank you for coming in. Oh, Appreciate my pleasure. It. Are you kidding me? I mean, you guys have been going around the clock, and I say it uh, sincerely from the bottom of my heart. What you and Reed have done around here, and Sean. Holding the fort down, you guys have done an unbelievable job. I hope you're able to catch your breath next week. Well, we got, I think we got more baseball and softball coming up. This is the grinding month. March is our grinder. It's a grind fest, but we'll be fine. Well, isn't April too? April uh, it's spread still out a little bit. Baseball and more. softball at Miami, right? All the time. It's a little more spread out. Okay, but yeah, this is our this is our. Uh, double header week weekend and then i think next week we have a lot of games too but trace and elliot will be back for that so okay. we should All be right. good okay well safe travels back whenever that is uh, if they're ever coming back to trace and elliot and nick and and jeremiah and who's a fi- I, I i never got the fifth guy taylor name. i believe is taylor his name. okay all right well safe travels to those guys hope they enjoy their weekend um did you ever get to Boogie Nights, by the way? It was asked in the chat. Did you no, ever get there? I, I never. We never did end up getting in there because the day that we went was the President's Day weekend. Yeah. And it was just so packed. All the ta- – like, I didn't even really get to gamble. 
There was one $25 roulette table. Oh, boy. And that just yeah. wasn't going to. Too rich. Too rich for yeah. my blood. Yeah. And then um, Boogie Nights was packed. There was a line. You had to wait to get in. Wow. So didn't make it. Maybe you'll uh, have to go some other time okay. here soon. All right. Okay. Well, we want to thank every one of you for uh, being with us, trying to uh, hold the fort down here in absence of the boys. Um, Reed's back Monday, I think, in this chair. We have our show dialed in with Tom Brenneman at 9.15 Monday morning. No show today at noon because we're doing this show here today. So 9.15, we'll be with you. Casey and I'll be here, good Lord willing, Monday morning. Uh, and then off the bench at 10, uh, Reed Mouse back in the saddle. And hopefully, Trace and the guys are back here on Tuesday. Casey, have a great weekend, my friend. Thank you, Tommy. Great job, as always, to each and every one of you. Godspeed ahead. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Monday morning.